Welcome to Urbanism Vancouver, a podcast that explores how our built environment shapes our everyday lives and community experiences. I'm your host, Helen Loy. Join me as we discover where we live, work, and play, and how we can shape better communities. With each episode, we'll bring a bit of insight and industry experience from myself and my guests. We'll dive into the inner workings of our urban surroundings and explore how places are planned, designed, and built, and discuss ways to create more livable, equitable, and sustainable cities. I hope that you'll learn a little and be inspired to be more curious and more involved in impacting positive change. Before we get started today, we want to acknowledge that this podcast is recorded and produced on the traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Musqueam, Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh nations. We pay our respects to their elders past, present, and emerging, and recognize the enduring connection they have to this land. We strive to have our conversations contribute towards reconciliation and work towards sustainability and equity for all the custodians of the lands. Public places are a huge part of community. They serve a variety of important functions to the well being of our society. So how do we ensure that they are well-designed, safe, but also welcoming for everyone in the neighborhood? Joining us today to talk about designing great public spaces are two guests from the firm Dialogue. First, architect and urban designer Amit Price Patel and Jill Robertson, landscape architect. So I grew up in a small town in the Midwest in the U.S. in Missouri. And knew I wanted to be an architect since I was six years old. Uh, I went to architecture school in St. Louis. And while I was there, I really felt like designing buildings wasn't enough. I really needed to understand planning and have an impact in the planning and at a larger scale, too. And I love the intersection of economics and history and, and politics that, that planning brings. So after I finished undergraduate, I went to South Africa for a year and worked for an architect there. And through that experience, I learned about the political power of architecture and design, that you're always working for someone and you're trying to create something that's taking up space in a city. I worked on the first apartheid museum there, and it was a really formative experience for me as a young designer with storytelling, telling stories in a really clear, simple way so that a broad audience can understand it and really instilled in me the, the power of design, the power of, of creating communities. I went back to St. Louis after that and started working in affordable housing. I applied to grad school, went to Berkeley for planning and architecture, and spent a year traveling around the world looking at high-rise social housing. Came back to Berkeley and finished up and moved to Boston, where I was doing urban planning and architecture for a couple of years. Came back to the Bay Area and spent the bulk of my career there working for an affordable housing firm as well as a urban planning engagement and placemaking firm. I moved to Vancouver about four years ago and have been a partner of urban planning and architecture with Joe at Dialogue and work on urban design projects, mixed-use residential projects, transit-oriented developments, and a lot of social housing projects. Awesome. So much, like so many varied experiences. Yeah, I shouldn't have had you go first now. I'm like, <laughs> oh, the bar is that really high. So I have known I wanted to be a landscape architect since I was 12 years old. So already behind the ball for my esteemed colleague. But part of what drew me to landscape architecture is that it sits at the intersection of science and art. And I really love that. When I went to university, in landscape architecture at the University of Guelph, I found it really affirming the ability to shape community and shape environment really around people. And since I graduated, I've been able to practice all across Canada. I've lived all across Canada and landed at Dialogue about 10 years ago. And what I love about Dialogue is we really see design as having the power to give 
voice to people. And part of the reason I'm at Dialogue is it's aligned with our purpose. And I think that it's really important as designers, we have a social responsibility to help make the communities and the environment that we design in better. And I love that I get to help be a little part of that process every day. I work across scale. So from doing very detailed technical landscape architecture all the way up to working on official community plans, but always with a focus on amplifying community voices and bringing people into the process and helping them shape and guide the evolution of of spaces that are going to make their lives better. I think maybe just to set the tone, it would be really good to hear from each of you how you define community. Like what are the bits and pieces that make community for you? I think for me, community is the people that you build your life with. And so to me, that means community can transcend temporal and spatial scales. Community can be the three people that I share my house with. It can be the people that live on my street. It's the people that I practice design with, but it's also the people that live in my city and live in my province and live in my country. So to me, I take a really broad definition of community. And when I'm working on a project, community is the people that want to be part of the process or deserve to be part of the process and need to be invited into that process. People that have agency in the outcome of that, of any given design process. But I I take a really broad definition of community. And for me, it's very much echoing what Jill said. I think of it in terms of scales of community from a social perspective and scales of community from a physical perspective. With the social aspect, it's really about those relational ties. What do you care about that someone else cares about? What do you share as a life experience that someone else cares about? Are you working together to make something happen? Then there are the physical aspects of community, and that's at the building, the block, your street, your neighborhood, your city. All of those can be defined as community, and you can participate in different ways in building your community. Earlier, you had said one of the things that stuck with you with what you do is that you're always kind of working for someone like hired on as a consultant. So I'm curious, in scoping what community means to you on all of those projects, do you ever find that definition doesn't align with what the owner sees? I think... Anytime there's engagement with the community, it brings value to a project, both in terms of the ideas that that the community has. Nobody knows a place better than the people who live there or use that place. So gathering those ideas to inspire the work that you're doing provides a lot of value. And sometimes it does take some convincing and helping our clients understand the, the, the value of having those kinds of conversations. The other kind of value that engagement brings and bringing the community into the process is that creation of trust, that change is always hard. Changes can can be scary for people. So providing some level of transparency about why something is happening, why a specific client wants to make a change in a neighborhood or a place can help build that trust, help ease the, ease the anxieties. One of the things that makes me really excited is I think that more and more our clients are asking us to have these conversations with the broader community. Even if I think back to 10 years ago, this idea of participatory designer and community engagement, it was new. It was a box checking exercise. And I think in the ensuing time, people have realized the value of this and understand that everyone has a different role to play on a project. And the architect or the landscape architect or the planner brings a certain expertise to the process. But I I love what Amit said, whereas everyone is an expert on something and the people that live in any given community or want to be part of any project, they have expertise that adds value and richness to that project. And so when you bring those diverse voices together to the table, Yes, there's uncertainty in the process. It often goes in a direction that nobody expects, but I find that the process is richer and then the outcomes tend to be richer. And I think more and more clients are really appreciating that and valuing that. So how do you go about approaching that of designing the process? It's always a very iterative process. I often start by saying we where we think we're going to go is not where we're going to end up. But I think one of the first things that we try to do very intentionally is say, who needs to be part of this conversation, who may not be at the table, and who do we need to invite in to be part of this process? 
it's very easy to design a process with sort of the obvious voices or the loud voices at the table. And more and more, we're seeing the the importance and the need to advocate for equity, for inclusion in the process. And so creating safety, physical safety, psychological safety, so that many people can be part of these conversations is something that we spend a lot of time at the beginning of a process, sort of mapping mapping that out. And in some cases, there's value in us actually stepping outside of the engagement process. We work with a lot of First Nations and, and Métis communities. And sometimes those communities need space to have their own conversations. And at the appropriate time, broader engagement can intersect with Indigenous First Nations, Métis engagement so that Again, it's about building that trust and having conversations to build confidence in what you're doing. And sometimes it's a matter of curation of who's, who's part of those conversations and, and when those happen. I would say as much as we are creators of design, we're just as much facilitators of design. I was really pleased to hear that Amit and Jill were intentionally approaching design with community at the core. And furthermore, challenging project teams to see the value in ensuring that well-facilitated engagement is embedded within the design process. Jill then speaks about a specific example of community engagement that they are currently working on. This is a project we're working on right now, helping with the public engagement for the Surrey Official Community Plan. So the Official Community Plan is sort of the overarching strategic plan that shapes how a city is going to evolve you know, essentially within the next five-year time frame. And so these are really important plans because they do shape communities' growth, evolution, investment, development. And so we're working with the city of Surrey to make sure that we're bringing diverse voices into that conversation. And what that means is a lot of diversity in tactics and tools and techniques. So again, I think the traditional paradigm for public engagement was a public meeting that it was held at five o'clock in the local school. There was a presentation and a vote, and it tended to draw a very uniform demographic. And so one of the techniques that we're using in Surrey is we're going to pop-up engagement. So we were out in the community on family day at the rec centers, giving out cookies and talking to people who were not necessarily expecting to talk about the future of Surrey. They were just out and about and enjoying their day but it gets people involved in the conversation in a different way. And the traditional idea of the public meeting, you know, if you are a parent that is driving your children to sports in the evening or you're caring for an elder or, you know, doesn't necessarily allow for inclusive participation in the process. And then some of the other things that we're really mindful of is thinking about multiple languages, multi-generational families. So we include virtual engagement, online engagement, again, really trying to broaden the reach so that as many voices as possible can be part of the conversation. And people like to communicate in different ways. Some people understand and like to communicate with text. Others like to communicate through drawing. Others like precedents to help unlock ideas that they have. I'm trying to tell people that I know, my peers and my family, to engage and Nobody has time to sit and watch like council meetings or follow no. along and, and know what's going on. So going to where people are at is really fantastic. And still, there are still so many barriers for people to get involved. Like language is one, creating like trust and safety, like you mentioned, is another is another thing. So given such a short amount of time where even for like a pop up, how do you how do you create that bit of trust and safety to get people to kind of open up? And when some of the projects might be proposing a lot of change to a neighborhood that people are very accustomed to. I think a good start is to ask open-ended questions and let people reveal whatever they want to reveal. It's not just not about guiding the conversation or saying, you know, trying to sell an idea. It's trying to get the best ideas to rise to the surface and let people just feel quite open and willing to to just share their ideas. I think the other aspect of it is showing people that they are heard as you are speaking with them. So that might be as simple as writing a post-it down so you, they understand that what they are saying is valued, it's being recorded, it's part of a larger conversation. So I think there's a physical aspect to it, there's a conversation aspect to it, there's the 
kind of presence that you're bringing as well. That, that you want to go in with a humbleness and humility to these conversations. And it's not about selling an idea. It's about communicating and sharing what, what's happening. Kind of two things I would build on are telling people how their feedback is used, but also telling them how their feedback is not used. I think it's really easy for a process to amplify the ideas that reinforce any sort of preconceptions that the project might have. But I found on particularly challenging projects, letting people know, yes, we heard you, but we didn't use that idea, but this is why. That builds support for the process. So I've worked in communities where people still hate your project, but they understand it and they support the process. They felt heard. They felt like they had the opportunity to speak their piece. And so they still end up supporting the project because they support the process and they felt that trust. And, and the second piece of that is, I think all too often we go into engagement processes with a preconception about what the outcome is going to be. And to have a meaningful process, you have to let that go. You have to be willing to go where the process takes you, to be open to new ideas and new outcomes. And so part of the designer's responsibility is to let go of those preconceptions so that you can be open to hearing what people have to say and let them shape your process and your project. And then they see that. And then they also, it builds trust kind of both ways. Most people from the public who engage, they maybe get one or two touch points, but unless they're really curious and following along, they may not see the full picture. So if you could kind of run us through a sample project of kind of the different levels of engagement you did and maybe some things that surprised you in terms of, you know, letting go of the design, the preconceived idea. I'll talk about the one that I was thinking about when I was talking about contentious projects. And it was a pedestrian bridge that was connecting two neighborhoods over a freeway. So generally, you would think pedestrian bridge for cycling and walking, people are going to like this. Yeah. No, people <laughs> hated this project. Uh, the the two neighborhoods that were disconnected by this freeway felt that the other neighborhood was where all the kind of, you know, bad things were going to happen and they were going to bring them into their neighborhood. It was very much a classic not in my backyard approach. So we started the process and we designed it with sort of three streams of input. We set up a community committee that had stakeholders from the, the homeowners association, from some of the organizations in each neighborhood. And we met with them almost on a monthly basis to give them updates to the project that they could then disseminate to their various groups within the community. And then we had a citywide public process because this was part of a broader bike strategy. So there was messaging that went out at the city scale to let people know that this was happening and how it was going to connect into the bike system. And then there was focus groups for stakeholders so different interest groups or, or non-governmental organizations within the community that had a vested interest. Then we shared all of the information from these kind of three streams back and forth so that if you went to, there was four public meetings in essentially an 18-month period. So if you could go to the, you could only go to one or two of the public meetings, we would spend the time to recap the process to make sure people were following along and they could get caught up. And we would again say, this is what we've heard so far. This is how we're using it. And this is the feedback that we heard that we're not using. And we were really clear with the community what they could engage on. And in this case, it was about improvements to the public realm that might mitigate some of the concerns about the pedestrian bridge. It was about community enhancements to the public space. We never asked people if they wanted a bridge or not, because the city was very clear, you're getting this bridge. And so we were very clear in communicating that to the community. This isn't a question about whether or not you want a bridge. It's about how can we make the bridge better, improve your quality of life. And I think that helped a lot. And, and at each meeting, we repeated that and repeated that and repeated that. And so again, at the end, we did have neighbors who said, we still don't want this bridge, but we really support this process. And because we had people that were very deeply embedded into the process as part of this community committee, they could be our ambassadors and go out and help spread the information, build trust with the neighbors, communicate key elements so that the people that wanted to just kind of flip in and out of the process at those public meetings had the opportunity to have the information that they needed to make informed commentary. And we did all this. Actually, this is a project that 
the public engagement started in February 2020. So oh we went gosh. from imagining a fully in-person process to needing to pivot to deal with the pandemic. So an, an extra layer of complication. Um, yeah. But I, I run into people from this community all the time and they still say to me, well, we don't really like the bridge, but boy, that was a really <laughs> good process. Well, that's good. I mean, that's the best you can do is like when you've come out of a process that even pe- if people objectively don't agree with the end product, that they respect, you know, the level of effort that was put in to engage with them. And they felt heard. And I think people at the end of the day, they just want to feel heard. And I, I think most people understand that sometimes decisions are going to be made for other reasons. But at least if they have, you know, they truly feel seen and heard and valued, that helps build that trust. Setting expectations, I think, is really important, too. And that's something that I also often see when you're going into a public hearing. It it almost is like if it's poorly run, it's like a black box of like throw all your comments at the wall. Right. But it's important to set the context of what it is that we're asking about how that information will be used. So that's a really great example. An example I can think of is a project in California a couple of years ago that I worked on where the residents of the community, there's a large landowner who, and there are several hundreds of apartment units there. The landowner found that there were several, there are, there are several deteriorating buildings there. So there, there, there's a need to make some improvements on the site. And the residents of the community were primarily low-income people of color who didn't have a lot of options about where they could move or where they could find housing in the broader region. So as a way to understand what the community needed and to help build trust, there was a very robust engagement process that we worked on with some specialists who, who knew the communities really well. You know, the starting point was for, for that was really conversations in people's living rooms and basically having one-on-one conversations. And those grew to dining table conversations. And then from that, there were larger and larger scales of engagement that happened. A landowner was able to make some small improvements in security and lighting and project management that helped build trust with that community. And through the engagement process, we learned that there were no places for kids to play and no place for people to to get exercise or gather together. And through that, we were able to identify a couple of vacant parcels in the area and turned those into one was called Boom Pop Park. The other was other one was called Bridge Pop Park. And the names were actually invented by some kids on the site there. We made places where people could play, where they could gather, where they could get access to services, whether it's, you know, a food bank or health services. There's a fitness track, a place where kids could learn how to ride bikes. And through that, through those tactical urbanism and, and temporary pop-up parks, it helped build the trust and the transparency and the relationships to allow some of that change to happen on the site over time. But it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of investment to build those kinds of relationships. Yeah, in design and the technical piece, those are the easy parts of our job. It's the communication and the relationship building that really takes time and, and effort. Yeah, for sure. But it's so important. I think particularly impressed that you guys went about talking to people like door to door. That's huge. One of the things Amit said that I really love is engaging with kids. And it's not always possible. But whenever we can, I love to have a workshop or engage kids. I think they have this unbounded creativity that adds richness to the project, including cool names like pop, bump, pop, cool park name. <laughs> um, but but also they they challenge us as adults, I think, on the paradigms that we bring to design. So I love right. when kids can come and push the design process. And then I also think it just builds good civic awareness for kids. My poor children, I drag them with me all the time to public events. But now that they know that they they should and have a voice in their city and can expect to comment. And I, and I think that helps build that next generation of good urbanists. I went to school here and I don't recall anything like that or any exposure to that, right, throughout elementary school or high school. And just even if they had like a field trip where they go to an engagement thing, how cool would that be to get that kind of exposure as a student? I want to switch gears a little bit. Amit, you talked about having places for people, for kids to play, and that touches upon, you know, this concept of third spaces that came up in a couple of our other episodes. And as we're thinking about our our social interactions and places for people to play and to just gather and and enjoy, 
I'm reflecting back on my own experiences working on the developer side, it's always so hard to carve out space for that because just realistically, that space doesn't make any money. Not that I don't see value in it. It's just like, if I'm looking at it from a financial point of view, that doesn't create revenue. But yet those spaces are so important because otherwise, wherever we're gathering, there's always, you know, there could be a cost to entry, like a coffee shop. You have to buy something in order to to hang out there, right? How would you say we're doing in terms of Vancouver or even Canada in terms of creating these really important spaces? Well, as a relative newcomer to Vancouver, I must say I'm really, really impressed and and actively use a lot of the third third places that you're talking about. My wife is a librarian, and in addition to you know general outdoor space and parks and community centers, libraries are so important for communities. It serves everybody from little tiny toddlers to seniors, immigrant communities, people learning English. They are amazing places, and so. The system of libraries, parks, community centers in Vancouver is absolutely mind-blowing to me as a newcomer. Obviously, there's room for improvement. There's always room for improvement. I think there is an opportunity to have more late-night places in Vancouver, bars. And, and, you know, I've got two teenage sons. They like to go and hang out at Brecca, which is a 24-hour coffee shop, right? And we need a lot more places like that. But places like Kitts Beach, dog parks, school playgrounds, temples, churches, gyms, all of those are important places to build a sense of community, to be with strangers, just have random conversations, and just get used to being with others without having the necessity to spend money at at a place. One of the things that I think the pandemic gave to us as a gift is helping us reconceptualize or rethink about public space. And I think before the pandemic, we were a lot more rigid in this is a space to do this one thing in, and this is a public space to do this other thing in, and and never the twain shall meet. And I think how we started using outdoor spaces in particular when we couldn't gather in our homes, you know, changed how people saw that. And suddenly the street became not just a space for cars, but a space for people and a space where we can dine and we can dine outside, even when it's raining, maybe if if we're covered correctly, or even when it's chilly. And, and it's really changed, I think, our tolerance for being outside, but also our expectations from it. And I, I really hope that as, you know, the design profession continues to push that to use these spaces in different and unconventional ways, because I think that's where that sense of community evolves, that sense of placemaking, and some of that spontaneous sort of social joy that brings us so much delight as humans. There are two examples that come to mind of those, that social joy and blurring of boundaries. One is Park Mexico in Mexico City. And I don't know if you remember, Jill, but it's an amazing place because it is in the Condesa neighborhood of Mexico City, which is, you know, just a beautiful historic place. And this park has this plaza in the middle of it. And it's a very simple, concrete, open space. And within that, there were people learning how to roller skate. There were dogs running around. There was a birthday party happening. There were um, a Zumba class, a Zumba class <laughs> happening, all nice. in the same place. Yeah. And along the edges of it were a couple of steps and a pergola. So you could either watch or be watched. And it's a completely flexible space. And I think Vancouver and North America in general could use more of those kinds of places that are just open and are super flexible and you have the choice of participating or not participating. The other example that comes to mind is a a street in India. And there is a lot of blurring of boundaries in a street in India where rickshaws and pedestrians and bikes and buses and camels and cows, they're all kind of mingling together. And the the boundary between a shop front and the street is completely blurred. This concept of blurred lines could really benefit North American cities, I think, because we're so didactic about here's the sidewalk, here's the property line, here's the setback, here's the park, and here's the part, the area that's not the park. So those blurring of boundaries isn't how life happens. It is much more organic than that. Vancouver is unique in the sense that like, we have quite a diverse population. 
The thing that comes with that, I think, is different understanding of what norms are or just social and cultural kind of backgrounds that might impact the way that people interact with public spaces or how you use them. And so I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are and if and how you take this into account when you are designing public spaces in Vancouver specifically. I mean, I think a big piece of that is having those community conversations to understand what other people want and desire and expect from their spaces. We all have our own individual biases and perspectives, and we'll design with those because they're unconscious. It's just part of human biology. But by broadening the conversation and the discourse, it allows for those diverse perspectives to start their weave their way into the design. So I think that's really the starting point and why, in particular, I think I mean, I put so much emphasis on an engagement process is to have those those multiple perspectives start to weave their way into the project. Yeah, and I would say with, uh, you know, Vancouver is very diverse, but it's becoming more diverse and there are many demographic changes happening here. So I think that there's an opportunity to have richer public spaces that make a broad range of people and cultures and religion and, and all the diversity of Vancouver feel welcome. And I don't think we should default to standards of how we design public spaces, you know, that this many people need a baseball diamond that's this size or whatever else. You know, maybe we need cricket, cricket fields and we need badminton courts and other things, other kinds of diversity to make people feel comfortable and feel like there are spaces for them. And one of the things you asked us at the beginning, Helen, and then we totally sidetracked you, <laughs> is about placemaking. Yeah. And, and so I'd, I'd originally actually looked up what the definition of placemaking is based on Project for Public Spaces, who are sort of the gurus of placemaking. And so they say it's a multifaceted approach to the planning, design, and management of public spaces. I was fortunate enough to do a week-long workshop with PPS about seven years ago. And the big takeaway I got from them, besides sort of some of the, the tactics of placemaking, is that it's ultimately about the context and it's about understanding the community that you are designing for. And that's how you can take information like guidelines and then tweak them so that they reflect the specific context. And so to me, it means that Park A can only exist in the community that exists. If you were to take it and move it somewhere else, it would have to be completely different because the community that, that it sits in is completely different. And so when I'm thinking about a design process or, or outcome, it ha it's, has to be so unique to the people that we're designing for that it would look entirely different if it was elsewhere. And I think the, the phrase placemaking can be problematic as well, because oftentimes when you say placemaking, it's negating what exists there already. So placekeeping is as important as placemaking. Now being able to, to be fortunate enough to, to work in a place that values First Nations or is beginning to value yeah. First Nations and, and this idea of placekeeping and connection to the land and connection to really rich culture, a, a lineage of culture is, is very interesting and important to balance both placemaking and placekeeping at the same time. That's a really good point. That's new to me. And I'm also new to the space of working with First Nations. And so I like that term, placekeeping. That's, that's great. Often when we go about doing design, I feel like there are a lot of boxes when you talk about, you know, regulations, whether it's at the city level or provincial or whatnot. So how do you navigate, you know, like the, the well-intentioned rules, for the lack of a better word, versus, you know, the focus on the people, on the context in order to derive the outcome that you wish to see? I think it's a matter of, yes, you acknowledge that there are standards and you can do a baseline design that's reflecting those standards. But by showing if you tweak this thing here or you tweak that thing over here, how much better it could be, what opportunities it opens up, how much more value and optimism and aspiration and wonderfulness can be brought by doing one or two things, it can, it can help unlock options, unlock different possibilities. 
And I think it's a spectrum and sort of there's control at one end of the spectrum and chaos at the other. And so control is like really rigid adherence to rules and standards and guidelines and chaos is none of the above. And you have to find where your project sits on that spectrum and it can't be too far one way or too far the other way because you need a little bit of chaos to have innovation. If it's too rigid and repeatable, you lose all of that creativity, which impacts that project, but it also impacts the city and its ability to grow and evolve and meet the the changing needs of the city. But again, we're designers. We have a social responsibility to design safe places for people. And so you need a little bit of that rigor. And so I think it's always navigating that fine line between control and chaos. And I think in all of our projects, we try to develop some key fundamental fundamental principles, our North Star for any project. And as we get into more of the details, we always refer back to that and say, are we really fulfilling our mandate to do this, this, and this? And if we're not, then maybe these standards need to be revisited. Maybe we need to think about it in a totally different way to to fulfill those original principles. Mm, That's a really good values-driven and people-focused, I think, approach. And then just linking that back with, you know, how your team really focuses on trying to involve voices that aren't always heard. How do you go about measuring that, right? Because how do you go about, I guess, measuring how many of the voices that don't normally get heard, right? Like, is there is there a feedback loop to go, okay, you know, we we've done this really well now and we've advanced. And then now there's still this group that like we had a real challenge talking to or connecting with. Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I mean, we collect data and, and we use that data then to refine our design. So usually on a process, we have a public engagement plan. And I always convey that it's a living document. And the Surrey example is a great one. So we've been collecting data on the communities that have been participating and the communities that, you know, what the numbers are. And then we know that certain communities maybe are underrepresented. And so are there more targeted pop-ups in that area? Do we do outreach? Do we need to do multilingual outreach? So we, we evolve our process in response to data and live feedback that we're getting. It's embedded in every sort of step. So it's in an entire phase, we're collecting data on the number of surveys. But at events, we ask for feedback. Did you like this? How do you want to be engaged going forward? How do you want to stay in touch with the process? And then making sure that we're cross-referencing that with the broader demographics of a community to make sure that people are not falling through the cracks or getting missed, that they have the opportunity to participate. And a lot of times that means going out and meeting people where they're at on their time schedule. And one of the things that we talk a lot about, particularly with First Nations engagement is that project time is a colonial construct. This idea <laughs> yes. that we are going to complete schematic design in the next three months. Yeah. That's fantastic. That may not align with the time scale of a community whatsoever. And so aligning engagement time and project time and Indigenous time and colonial time, those things are not always going to line up and building that into the process as well. We've been using this phrase in our projects, moving at the speed of trust, which does not necessarily ah. move at the same time as a as a specific project schedule. I love that. I might have to steal that. Yeah. <laughs> I really like that. That's really good. In terms of like the outcomes of the spaces that are like done, built, you know, people are using it. Do you have a feedback loop in terms of going back and engaging in with the people who are using it and understanding, did my intended design of these aspects or this space get used the way that I had pictured or envisioned? Or was it like completely different? Or were there new ways? I think we could always be better at doing those post occupancy evaluations. I think we really try to. But then also there's there's an informality to it. I remember the day that Rainbow Park opened, they were literally taking the construction hoarding down. And then five minutes later, all of these kids showed up with balloons and a birthday cake to have a birthday party in the park, literally on its first day that it had opened. And I remember sitting there watching that going like this, it kind of, it was so exciting and it blew my mind and it was really positive feedback, just how how needed that space was and how it, it, it has been used in different ways. And I think the last time I was there, I was asking some people and they were like, we can't talk to you. We're too busy playing. So <laughs> that's also, a great answer. That's a, a great sign. answer. Yeah. yeah. 
I love that park, by the way. Like, I know a lot of people that were like, yeah, parks should have like this and that. And I'm like, no, I love that. Like, as an adult, I go there. I hang out there. It's fun. What I really love about that park is it helps families live downtown. You know, from the moment it opened, it was packed with kids. And it showed that there's a lot of families living downtown. And by having that resource, and there should be many, many more rainbow parks in dense urban areas, it makes life easier for for families and and you know the default doesn't have to be a single family house somewhere you can have a really great family life downtown and i think i think there's an equity piece to it too that you know if we're going to talk about urbanism in vancouver we need to talk about the fact that it's a challenging moment and there are lots of people that are struggling in our community but they still deserve equity and inclusion in our communities. And one of the things about Rainbow Park is that it allows families and children to own that space, but without necessarily gentrifying or excluding other members of the community. I've been in that park and seen someone sleeping on a bench next to a $2,000 stroller. And the fact that both of those things can exist, I mean, it's too bad that they can exist, but there's, there's an equity piece to that that I think is important in this moment in an urbanism conversation that we, we need to talk about. And that is happening in you know, Rainbow Park is a good example where both of those things can exist in, in a little bit of a balance. I would say that the most important public spaces that we have are sidewalks. I mean, the, fa- the most important thing first is to have a sidewalk so that people can walk around and, and be next to each other and get to know each other. During COVID, of course, the sidewalks in your neighborhood were the most important thing in the world, right? And all of the friends that I have in my neighborhood, I met during those times, you know, where we were doing our fourth daily walk of the day and <laughs> walking the dog around. And through that, you got to know people, you had the time to chat with them, and yeah. it all happened at the sidewalk. I really enjoyed my conversation with Amit and Jill and the insight they provided into the process of designing great spaces. I asked them to share a bit about their favorite project that they have been involved in designing. One I've spoken about before, it's a park in Edmonton called Kanistanaw Park. And Kanistanaw is a Cree word that means we three. And it's reflective of the colonial, indigenous, and Chinese cultures that have roots on the site of our park. And it has a red canopy with a Métis beading pattern as the public art that's engraved into the canopy. And then it's etched on some granite in the ground plane. And the red represents the Chinese culture. And then the Métis beading pattern represents the, the Cree heritage of the site. And when I see both of those elements, they're, they're beautiful to me, but I, they don't have the same meaning necessarily, or, or they didn't until I was happened to be on the park one day. And there was a gentleman lying in the grass and he and I ended up talking and and he told me that he was in the park there in mourning because a couple of days earlier, three of his friends had overdosed in the park and he'd come to this space to grieve. But he said to me that he felt safe to do so because he was Cree and he recognized the Cree pattern on the canopy. And he said, that's how I know that this place is for me. That's how I know that I am welcome and safe in this space because you've included this message that says you are valued here. And, you know, this was two and a half or three years into a design process. The park had just opened and I'd never thought about it that way. And it really reminded me of the way that I see the world is not the same way that other people see the world. And I think that that's really important to make sure that we as designers are adding those elements or weaving those perspectives into the park so that people feel safe and included and welcomed. And so, When I get asked this question, I love to tell this story because it's been so impactful to me. And for me, it's a project called Spark It Place in California that I worked on many years ago. And we were working for a nonprofit housing developer who had this vacant site. And there really aren't very many safe outdoor spaces in that neighborhood. It's a very low income neighborhood. And what we did was create this marketplace and the marketplace was really meant as meant for neighborhood local grassroots businesses to come and sell their wares whether it's clothing that people are making or candles or whatever else but also part of this space which was done on a very low budget 
is a community garden, is a performance space, is a play space, is a place for bikes, place to make artwork. And it was a really meaningful project for me because through a low budget intervention, we were able to bring the community together. And I'm I'm very proud of that project. That's really nice. Thank you. Thank you both for sharing. Thank you so much for, you know, taking time to chat with me and sharing some of your experience and, you know, insights on the planning and designing side. I think that I know some of it, but I also learned a lot and I love what you guys are doing with the engagement. I hope that more projects will be more thoughtful about the way that they think about community. And I I also think that it would really be great if more of the general public was kind of interested and curious and more involved in some of those discussions. Well, thank you so much for having us. And certainly if you're listening, I would encourage you to go out to the public engagement events in your neighborhood because your voice is important in shaping your city. Thank you, Helen. And and to anyone listening, I would say go and use your public spaces and invest in them, love them, and uh, support them. Designing great spaces for community first requires a good definition of community, one that welcomes and includes anyone and everyone who might have agency in the outcome of the design and its process. This process should also include wholesome engagement, which means truly listening, valuing, and responding to the community. Not only do we have to invite people to participate, We should also meet them where they're at to have these conversations. This allows us to gain respect and build safety, which is why, as Amit says, we need to move at the speed of trust. This foundation of including all members of the community and ensuring a rigorous engagement creates a basis to which designers are accountable. As Jill mentions, designers have a social responsibility to help make the communities and the environment that we design in better. That means being aware of their own biases and perspectives and allowing space to have the process go differently than they might have envisioned. And most importantly, it includes acknowledging the Indigenous nations and histories who have existed long before many of us in Canada, because placekeeping must also be part of the design process. I hope my conversation with Amit and Jill have inspired you to see and value our public spaces a bit differently, and perhaps to consider taking the time to engage with spaces that are currently being shaped and transformed. Good public spaces only happen if they serve all members of the community, and that includes you. You've been listening to Urbanism Vancouver, the podcast dedicated to bettering our built environment. Be sure to follow us on your listening platform of choice so you don't miss our future releases. I'm Helen Loy. Thanks for listening. This podcast series was independently funded and produced by myself and Aaron Johnson. Visit us at urbanismvancouver.com.